to all of you and uh, who made it uh, this morning after the, the party uh, the night before. Um, I'm Raymond Schiffelers. Uh, I'm chairing this session. Uh, I'm from University Medical Center in Utrecht. Um, and I'm going to talk about the engineering of extracellular vesicles and trying to make use of them as, an, uh, as a drug delivery system. Um, and I'm the first speaker, so I, I think I have the burden to at least explain something about extracellular vesicles. Um, and and uh, uh, why we thought of them as intriguing drug delivery systems. Um, the, 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 the interest stems from the fact that um, people have observed that there are nano-sized vesicles secreted from cells. Um, they, they are uh, similar to, uh, to the liposomes that we're all uh, accustomed with. Um, and they can transport molecules between cells. So um, this is the, uh, the donor cell. And they secrete these nano-sized, about 100 nanometers in size, uh, extracellular vesicles that can be transported between the donor cell and the acceptor cell. And there are uh, different kinds of extracellular vesicles around. Uh, some of them are uh, 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 secreted from the, uh, from the surface of the cell, from the cell membrane, and those are known as microvesicles, primarily. And other ones are uh, formed by um, invaginations of uh, in, inside these organelles, multivesicular bodies, and they are secreted as a bunch, and they are known as exosomes. Um, in the end, because um, after their secretion, basically it's very difficult to distinguish them. There are no unique parameters to, to distinguish these uh, types of vesicles. Uh, they're known as extracellular vesicles to sort of, uh, well, avoid any discussion, basically, uh, upon what type of material you actually have. Uh, what is intriguing, of course, is the fact that um, these vesicles contain RNAs, messenger RNAs, microRNAs, but also proteins, proteins like um, uh, um, uh, membrane proteins, for example, and they can actually be functionally delivered into the acceptor cell. And that is something that we really struggle with in the synthetic delivery uh, system field, the fact that we, uh, the, the, the delivery of these biomolecules, messenger RNAs, microRNAs, are notoriously difficult to deliver. And um, these extracellular vesicles offer a new avenue in trying to deliver those, uh, those, uh, those molecules. Um, and we've worked on this problem and, and, and demonstrated that actually we can deliver something like messenger RNAs uh, within extracellular vesicles. And it's really a, a, a study that has been primarily done in the lab of Jacob van Rehne, where we use this molecular biology tool to try and, and see how we could visualize that messenger RNA would really be delivered. And these are uh, the, uh, the donor cells that produce Cree messenger RNA. And uh, when this Cree recombinase messenger RNA is delivered to an acceptor cell that has been engineered to express red fluorescent protein and a stop codon between LOX P sites, upon arrival of Cree messenger RNA, this will actually be uh, a trans a translated into the Cree recombinase, the LOX P site will ensure that this red fluorescent protein is cleaved out, and as a result, um, the green fluorescent protein will be expressed. So we can observe a color change to observe Cree messenger RNA being actually uh, transported and functionally delivered into the acceptor cell. Uh, so we use, make use of, use of this, uh, this system, and uh, what is striking is, first of all, if we uh, implant donor and acceptor cells in the same flank of, uh, of a mouse, you see the blue donor cells and the red acceptor cells, and some of them indeed turn green. So this mechanism of communication between cells is actually taking place. But what is more striking even is the fact that we, if we implant them in two flanks of the, of the mouse, also you see green cells appearing. So this, these vesicles that contain Cree messenger RNA even can transport messenger RNAs across the mouse into and, and, and transfect a tumor in a different flank. And it doesn't only deliver Cree messenger RNA. These are the donor cells. They are quite malignant, and they move around a lot. Um, these are the red cells, the acceptor cells that are usually quite benign, and they don't really move around that much. But after they've turned green, so after they have received their Cree messenger RNA and the, the, the LOX P site has been cleaved out and they turn green, uh, there's a lot more that's being delivered together with it. And actually they turned more malignant as a result. So um, these, these vesicles 
um, can transport over a distance and can transport really relevant biological molecules, something that we struggle with within the synthetic delivery system. So what we set out to do is try to engineer these vesicles and try to make use of them, not only uh, making use of their natural tropism, but also trying to modulate where they go to. And we made use of several tools from the liposome field. Um, and this is uh, one of the tools where we try to use post-insertion um, to get a, a ligand on the surface of, um, of, a, of an extracellular vesicle. So we made micelles of PEG coupled to a phospholipid. Um, and if we couple a nanobody uh, to the surface of those micelles, just by co-incubation of vesicles with the micelles at, at uh, an elevated temperature, we can ensure that the ligand is incorporated into uh, the bilayer. And this shows some of the, uh, of the controls. First of all, we can see that we can couple the nanobodies to, uh, to the, uh, the PAC anchors. Uh, we can show that we have, indeed, uh, extracellular vesicles with ALEX, TSG-101, and CD9. Those are the markers for extracellular vesicles. And if we incubate them with the micelles at different temperatures, 4 degrees, not that many, 60 degrees, quite a lot of these micelles get incorporated into the bilayer. 60 degrees is probably not that good for biological function, but 60 degrees is the, is the most optimal from that perspective. But we settled uh, basically on 40 degrees to incubate those micelles with the, uh, with the extracellular vesicles. Well, you can see on electron microscopy that actually the ligand is on the surface, and uh, uh, even if you uh, incubate them with the micelles, it doesn't really change their characteristics. They're about 100 nanometer size vesicles. Um, and when they interact with cells, it's really dependent on their status. So it, it shows that the ligand really confers a new specificity to the extracellular vesicles. <coughs> Neuro2As, those are cells without the EGF receptor, and A431s are the ones with the EGF receptor. And here you can see that the Neuro2A cells really don't show any interaction with the uh, micelle-decorated extracellular vesicles. Uh, and the ones that have been incubated with the... Uh, with the micelles really show a uh, nice interaction, which is highest for the 40 degrees incubated micelles together with the, uh, with the extracellular vesicles. Um, we also took a different approach, where this one was after the extracellular vesicles have been made, we incubated them with micelles, or so the sort of synthetic approach, but we also engineered the cells trying to modulate their tropism by uh, already um, uh, changing the characteristics from the production onwards. Uh, so we, um, we designed a factor uh, where the nanobody is actually produced inside the cell, and it has a decay accelerating factor a signal that actually leads to a glycosyl phosphatidyl inosyl, uh, inosyl uh, anchoring of the nanobody on the surface of, the of a membrane, of cellular membranes. And the moment that extracellular vesicles are formed, we have an increased production of these uh, nanobody decorated extracellular vesicles. Um, again, some of the characterization. First of all, we see that almost exclusively this nanobody uh, is excreted on onto uh, the extracellular vesicles. It's not, this is a marker for the, uh, for the extracellular vesicles. It's the HA domain within the, uh, within the uh, nanobody uh, construct. Cell lysates do not really contain the nanobody, but it's exclusively present on the, uh, on the extracellular vesicles. These are the controls for the, uh, for the extracellular vesicles, basically. And again, we have about 100 nanometer vesicles, and uh, the, again, the uh, nanobody is present on the surface of the extracellular vesicles. And again, the cell interaction is dependent, really, on the EGFR status, neuro2As, hardly any, uh, or no EGFR, HeLa cells, hardly any EGFR, and a for three ones, a lot of EGFR, and you can see that the extracellular vesicle interaction is really mediated by the presence of this nanobody on the surface and, of course, on the EGFR status of, uh, of the cells. So, uh, in conclusion, we can really modulate the, uh, the cell specificity of extracellular vesicles by putting a new nanobody on the surface, um, but it's all in vitro, of course. And the next step is, how does it pan out in vivo? Uh, and that is something of, of, well, of a disappointment, basically, because in the synthetic uh, delivery field, in the liposome field, we really are accustomed to hours of circulation time and 
uh, a lot of uh, uh, cell interactions enabled by this long circulation time. And if you look at our extracellular vesicle preparations, these are the extracellular vesicles in their native form, isolated and injected as a bolus. You see a very rapid clearance and really undetectable after 10 minutes. Uh, if, we in, uh, if we use these uh, post-inserted PEG micelle decorated extracellular vesicles, it's slightly prolonged, but still it's uh, about 10% only circulating after 10 minutes. And indeed, it, it, you can still detect them after one hour and perhaps even after four hours, but it's, it's only a marginal percentage of the injected dose that is circulating at that time. So it's a very short time span uh, um, during which these extracellular vesicles uh, uh, can be seen. And where do they go to? Well, not surprisingly uh, for people in, in this field at least, is the fact that uh, they go to the liver and spleen. So this is the background. These are the, the natural tropism of our isolated extracellular vesicles, primarily the liver, a liver, little bit into the spleen. Uh, by pegylating them, we avoid a little bit the recognition by the liver, but it's immediately taken over by the spleen because the, 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 the spleen compensates for that little loss. Um, so, uh, and, and if you look at the, uh, the desired target organ, the tumor, you hardly see any accumulation there. Um, so I think, concluding, uh, remarkable biological effects, going back to the, um, to the extracellular vesicles that deliver Cream messenger RNA from one, f uh, uh, one tumor in one flank to another tumor in, in another flank. Uh, we've shown that they can be engineered using methods from the liposome field, but also by modifying the producer cells, so recombinant uh, bi uh, molecular biology. At the same time, if you look at the extracellular vesicles, but also the engineered extracellular vesicles, they do behave as first-generation liposomes in vivo, fast clearance by MPS organs, and that really dictates their distribution over the body. Um, so in the end, well, Sander Koymans did uh, primarily the work supported by uh, Clara. Steve Ruffler supplied the plasmid uh, of the DK accelerating factor, and Peter Vader is uh, heading the, uh, the lab uh, efforts in our, in our uh, team. And, uh, well, it was supported by the ERC grant. So thanks for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> questions, yes, DJ. Yes, thank you for your presentation. So you have uh, shown that you can engineer, so add some component for the targeting, for, yeah. for instance, but extracellular matrix can be considered as waste for the body. So especially uh, phospholipid, yeah. uh, phosphatidylcholine, serine are recognized as a foreign body or to, yeah. to be extracted. Can you chemically modify this phospholipid or can you engineer, remove some phospholipid or chemically modify this phospholipid um, to prolong? We were, we were sort of hoping to achieve that with the, the post-insertion and the pegylation strategy, really to sort of cover up yeah, this, but these signals. But, it, but indeed, they're, they're, it's they're still they're, missing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that could be a strategy. We, we, um, for example, we also used an, um, a recombinant protein that was um, w where we have the phosphatidylserine binding domain of lactoterin and engineer that to an antibody. Yeah. That partly also takes care of, the, uh, of, of at least the tropism, but it doesn't take away the, the fast clearance. So okay. we're struggling to, to, get that, uh, to get that right. I, uh, I agree. It's, it's, it, that proves to be really difficult. Another strategy could be that this is, um, th these are the extracellular vesicles isolated as a whole, yeah. where we just yeah, took the, the entire prep. Um, yeah. It could be that extracellular vesicles in the majority are composed of particles that are very fast cleared. Mm. But there could be a subfraction that is actually more uh, uh, circulating longer and having a different tissue and tropism that is size, overwhelmed by the... the size distribution is... is, is yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's roughly it's, it's, 100, but you have but so many exactly. big, bigger yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. And you see the vast majority is about 100 nanometers, which would be the ideal circulation time mm -hmm. from a synthetic mm -hmm. point of view. But, um, whether that is the same for the extracellular vesicles is, that really remains to be investigated. I think people haven't really started to look at distribution profiles of the different subfractions yet, okay. unless, Imre, you have new information. Slow. Last question. Last question. Oh, sorry. Last question. Hans? Oh, sorry. No, Hans. Uh, do you have a question, Imre? Or not? No. Hans. signal back in, so you're kind of fighting the tide a wee bit, fighting the current of 
of stuff being released at great volume by the uh, by the tumor cell when you're trying to get the exosome to pop back into it in effect. Yeah. Is that yeah. the problem, or one of the problems? Uh, that, 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 that is one of the problems. So if you, although we, if we go to primary cells or stem cells, for example, we do see the same phenomenon. So it, it appears to be something inherent that the majority of vesicles, if we isolate them the way we do, which could be maltreating them and losing some of the essential proteins that are there to promote their function, um, uh, then we see this fast clearance profile. And um, so either it's a fact of that, that the majority of, of vesicles is actually not circulating very long and are destined to go to the, to the MPS because they're waste management, waste management, basically, or we are maltreating them using our uh, isolation protocols. And as a result, we end up with vesicles that do not perform uh, as functional as they could have been, uh, could have do, done in uh, in uh, in another situation, or where they where they would have, we would have been able to preserve their natural conformation. Basically, that is something that we're struggling with.